about six months ago, I looked at the title and I kind of thought, hmm, computers, maybe I ought to get hooked to the, up to the internet. About three months ago, I went, oh my God, I better get hooked up to the internet. So uh, now part of this was not completely my fault. Uh, I, I uh, got hooked up to the internet finally through the Prodigy system that I have on my personal computer. I tried to do... I tried to do a situation through my home institution, but was unable to, simply because uh, we've had some technical glitches. We've had MCI as our sponsor, and they didn't know what they were doing, and various things. But I finally got on the internet, and I must say, I must, I want to first. I don't normally thank people for making me do presentations, uh, but basically, it's a situation where doing researching this presentation was very helpful because I had no idea the resources available on the World Wide Web, Usenet, and the other internet no. services. Oh I think you're going to have to take a trip. Okay. Anyway, uh, so what I would like to do in terms of the structure of this, see you guys later. Structure of this, <laughs> haven't seen him in a month, okay, I've been in Mississippi, so. Um, I want to take you through four of what I think are four of the most helpful election year uh, websites and talk about the pluses and minuses and then talk generally about where I see academic research, uh, professional research for communication scholars going on the internet because there are some good things and bad things about it but there are some troubling elements as well. Uh, first off, in terms of the websites, I tried to give you the addresses. If the addresses don't pan out, sorry, but I, I, this is what, how I access them. I, I used Yahoo and another uh, web browser that are offered through Prodigy. I was a member of Prodigy two and a half years ago and the system frankly sucked. Uh, they now are hooked to the internet and they really, it's excellent. I'm really impressed with the new Prodigy and I would encourage you if you're looking for an online service, I know everybody goes with AOL, but it, a Prodigy, the new Prodigy deserves a look. They really have done some nice things to fix the system. It was not very good before. Um, I went first to the Democratic National Committee website and basically taking you through the order I went. I am a neophyte internet person. I am not a computer nerd, but I may become one after this paper. I really got into this. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it became a joy to go through this and look at the different sites. The Democratic Party website, uh, there are basically four standards I used and looked at this. First, how's the set site set up? Some are easier to navigate through than others. Second, what's available in terms of information, what's the quality of that information, and finally, what are, how can you use this information? As far as the Democratic Party website, now, I'll be, I'll just admit it, okay, I got Bill Clinton's picture in my basement, so I'm a Democrat. I was really heartily disappointed with the Democratic webpage. Uh, it's overly politicized. There are even claims about both Dole's record and Clinton's record that are not substantiated. They don't have source citations backing up where they got these claims for, and it's, that's troubling. Uh, but there are some elements of it that are interesting, and it certainly gives you a flavor for, for presidential politics. Uh, the website is broken up into different subfiles, of course, as they all are. The Democratic website did have a convention site. It's pretty much been dismantled with audio and video hookup. You could watch the convention live. The problem, that's problem number one I highlighted at the end of, back into my paper, and that is basically that's the first problem. You've got to spend some money, or your institution does, getting you sound boxes, a proper type of monitor, I would recommend VGA or Super VGA monitor to get all the color graphics, to be able to enjoy the internet to its fullest, and also um, a web browser, a secure web browser, like I believe Netscape would fall into that category, that when, if you want to access, like for instance, let's say you want to become a member of the Democratic Party online, or you wanted, the other night I wanted to book my hotel reservations in Nashville for my interim stop here through La Quinta Inn's homepage, and I got all the way through, I filled out all the information, I'm like, this is great, and and it's like you, your browser won't let you do this. So, and that's simply, it's not a bad thing. It's simply to protect your, your privacy, your credit card numbers and such. So you need a secure browser. If you don't have those things, which, guess what, I don't, uh, you're in trouble. So you, to take full access of a lot of these websites, you need those technological uh, additions to your system. And you need a 486 computer, I think. I, I upgraded to a 486, fortunately, right before I came because I was having a lot of trouble even hooking onto a service because my computer wasn't up to the task. All right, some of the different things that are in the Democratic webpage. Of course, uh, news notes, 
which basically press conferences, a variety of uh, uh, press releases that are put out by the party concerning the campaign. Uh, the 21st Century Express, which was, of course, Bill Clinton's train trip to the convention. Uh, it's interesting. It's got uh, speeches from every site that he visited along the way, including Ashland, Kentucky. And what's amazing is I don't see why it's there. It's really a waste of space because it's 15 speeches, and they're all the same, except for the salutations at the beginning, which are rather funny, and the closing remarks like, Billy Ray Cyrus, thanks for coming. You made my daughter's day. Uh, you know, Bill Clinton, if nothing else, you get the impression Bill Clinton knew, knows all these people personally, even though you know he couldn't, and he just, it, it just gives you a, a flavor for the local nature of American politics. But beyond that, it's not worth a whole lot. The interactive map is cute, uh, though you can just plot in, you know, point your mouse and click to the site, but as far as hard, hard copy research, it's, it's not that valuable. But you can print out the speeches or the addresses, so it's helpful in that sense. Um, the donkey stomp is really kind of disappointing. The donkey stomp is basically the trash page against the Republican Party. It has uh, a report on the 104th Congress, which you can imagine isn't very positive. It has a separate subfile for Newt. I wonder why. Uh, it has uh, a separate subfile on Bob Dole and Jack Kemp. It has an interesting little section where they have quotes from Jack Kemp trashing Bob Dole, Bob Dole trashing Jack Kemp, including the infamous joke about uh, there's good news and bad news. The good news is a whole bus of supply ciders went over a cliff. The bad news, Jack Kemp wasn't one of them. Uh, so it has all kinds of horrible humor about directed from inter-Republican humor during the mainly the uh, 88 and 84 primary campaigns. Um, the uh, the Get Active section, of course, gives you a chance to actually get hooked into the Democratic Party, donate money, become a member. Uh, it also gives you a chance to, uh, to, to send email messages to different people. I hooked in. Now, of course, the websites, if you're not familiar with how they operate, the link part, the reason it's called the web, I figured out, of course, is it is also often connected to other websites. For instance, the Democratic Party webpage hooked up to the White House webpage, uh, parts of it anyway. Uh, it's also hooked up to state Democratic Party web pages, which I find very helpful. If you're going to do research on specific senators or congressional races, you can email some senators and congressmen, House representatives directly. And I did that. I wrote a note to Harry Reid, who's my former senator from Nevada, and sent him a little email message. And you can certainly uh, email uh, people who are prominent members of the committee itself. So I think for access and, and printing out speeches and addresses, the Democratic web page works well for that. But a lot of the information, if you're looking for stuff that's substantiated and proven, that you can just print right off. Uh, I'd be a little leery of using some of the stuff because a lot of it isn't cited, particularly claims about Dole's record. All right, let's go to the White House webpage, um, or pardon me, Dole for President. Uh, the Dole for President page, again, I told you my leanings uh, outside of being an academic, uh, uh, and that is, uh, is surprising, but I came down uh, with both feet on this webpage and really enjoyed it. I found it to be much better than the Democratic Party webpage. First of all, they have a sense of humor. Leader has a web-connected website. Leader, the <laughs> Dole dog. I thought that was cute. Uh, there's an entire thing, Dole Interactive, had all kinds of games. Now, my guess is this was for laptop aficionados at the convention. You can do Bob Dole crosswords. You can create your own Bob Dole poster. I've done it. Uh, you can do all kinds of fun things. And I, uh, not that that's a, a, a ringing endorsement, but it just seemed like they were having a little more fun with the technology than the Democrats were. They also are much more into graphics, uh, click on items, uh, all kinds of pictures and portraits. The file about about the team, which is complete biographies on everyone, is all, like all the Kemp family members, all the Dole family members, are is amazing. Uh, and you can learn a lot if you're doing just basic research on background of the two members of the team and their families, wives and husbands and grandchildren and all. Great place to go. Uh, Dole Interactive, of course, I've talked about that. It's also your chance to hook up with uh, membership if you want. Join the, join the and I did do that. Uh, I'm on the Dole email list, so when special things happen, like suddenly Bob Dole's going to be on CNN, reportedly I'll get an email message about that. Um, the uh, other element of this, of course, is they have to have their trash page. The Dole agenda is the trash page. Uh, but unlike the Democratic Party webpage, they do document each claim they make about Clinton. Now, there's no guarantee that the documentation is correct, but at least they make an attempt to document it. Uh, and I liked that in contrast to the Democratic claims about, about Bob Dole. Um, the Dole agenda is a complete printout. You have an executive model version of his economic plan, which is just two pages. You have the long version if you want it. You have the Republican Party platform in here. So there's, there's lots of access to official 
party documents and campaign documents, and you can print them out. I mean, if you're, as long as you don't have problems with your printer hookup, you can print them directly from the screen, and there's no problem with that. So overall, I was much more impressed with the Dole uh, uh, web page and, and connected sites. You are connected to the RNC page. It's a link. You are connected to um, uh, the, uh, 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 some of the you know, Republican Senate and House members. So I think it's real helpful in that sense. It is not as connected, however, as the C-SPAN page. The C-SPAN page, I would almost suggest you start. If you're going to do political election research on the Internet, start with the C-SPAN page. It is link central. It's connected to everybody, the Democrats, the Republicans, the Reform Party, the debate council that's deciding, arbitrating when the debates will occur. C-SPAN is probably the best of these websites. And, of course, C-SPAN, as Jim will tell you, having both of us having gone to C-SPAN uh, programs in Washington, uh, C-SPAN is... They work very hard to be completely objective and neutral. It is the hallmark of their existence. Okay, let's go to the White House webpage. The White House webpage is interesting. It is a blend of history and political posturing. Uh, some parts are, if you're a tourist and you're going to D.C. and you want to learn about the White House, the White House virtual tour is a great place to be. If you're doing election research, it's not. Uh, there is a section on the Citizen's Handbook. The Citizen's Handbook subfile uh, connects you with other government agencies, so that's helpful. Uh, the uh, virtual library has a backlog of presidential speeches and addresses, so that could be helpful. Uh, the briefing room is pretty much current press briefings and notings. There was a lot of stuff when I tracked through it last week about Iraq, as you can imagine. I printed out an executive order concerning our treatment of Iran and the refugee problem that Iran is experiencing because of the Kurds running across the border and how Interestingly, we're in Iran's corner on that. We're really trying to help them, according to the executive order. It was about a five-page document I printed out. So that's really exciting. And, of course, to note, you can send email to President Clinton. I did. I sent him a nasty one. I said, don't get us into a war. Uh, I didn't get a response back. wonder why. Uh, but uh, this was what it still looked like we were going to go over there and start kicking, you know, kicking butt in bushy in fashion. Um, so... That, that was basically where I, where I went with this. A connection to this is that a lot of U.S. senators, John Ashcroft was one of the first in April of 96, a, a senator from Missouri, who to promote his support of term limits and a term limits petition, started his own website and encouraged people as a first action to sign on to the website and sign his petition. And so uh, a lot of senators and House members, not all, like for instance, I told you about Harry Reid, who's, who's the junior senator from Nevada, uh, Dick Bryan, uh, who's the senior senator from Nevada, Dick Bryant, is not hooked up to email. And that doesn't make any sense to me. I, I think if you're a, a person concerned with, you know, being uh, connected to your constituents, you need to be hooked up to email, particularly at that level of government. And there are a lot of House and Senate people who are not. Um, the, in terms of the last web page I looked at, I looked at several others, but these were the four most valuable. Uh, the C-SPAN web page, it isn't so much that C-SPAN has a lot of substantive research data you could use, but they're such an intermediary to other websites. They're hooked up to everybody, from government organizations, think tanks, the political parties I previously mentioned. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, and, and some of the stuff C-SPAN has ranges from very helpful to nebulous, like they had their convention coverage, which was, of course, now virtually useless unless you're doing a retro. Or they talk about the parties and the socialization. They gave a good background of what goes on with them when the TV cameras are not on, uh, and I think that's helpful. Book notes, a lot of the regular features, if you're a C-SPAN junkie as I am, book notes, which occasionally interviews authors who do political tomes. Uh, uh, is helpful, but I would have to say the most helpful part is probably the road to the White House and then all the links that they provide because uh, they don't, I don't think they put as much energy into the web page generating original material as they do hooking you into other groups. So, but I do, I do recommend. And the, the last thing I'll say about the uh, C-SPAN homepage web page is they're hooked up to the Washington Post and Washington Times. And you want a couple, well, I don't know about the Washington Times, but the Washington Post, you couldn't ask for a better newspaper plugged into what's going on in Washington politics. I went into that paper. They've got backlogs. You can go directly to the Washington Post and, and even look at the newspaper for the upcoming. It was 3 in the morning when I'm looking at the website, and I'm looking at the headlines. People are going to pay hard money to get on their front doorstep. So I, I, an interesting thing, obviously, is going to be, and I, this is my little future cyberspace prediction, there will come a day when I don't think you'll hear the plop of the newspaper on your step. Instead, you'll walk into your 
you know, with your bedroom robe on and your slippers or whatever attire you have in the morning, stumble to your PC, flip it on, go to your website for your newspaper and read the newspaper off the internet and you want to print something off, you will. If you don't, you don't have that nasty recycling problem we have. So there's an environmental impetus or people will get it on disk if they don't, if they need to take it somewhere. But I don't think we're, newspapers are going to fundamentally change in the next few years. They have to, uh, if for no other reason than the cost of paper and ink have, have, have pumped up so, so uh, greatly. So those are some things to think about. Cap Campaign 96, the Washington Journal are all uh, sub-files in the C-SPAN page. They too are helpful. Uh, and, and therein uh, lies the, 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 a couple of the problems I want to highlight before I turn it over to Jim. There are basically four concerns I have about using the Internet. Uh, in uh, this month's September-October issue of uh, Columbia Journalism Review, uh, there was a meeting of Internet providers and, and uh, people in the industry, including Bill Gates of Microsoft. And in that article, they discuss a concern and that is, yeah, the Internet's a big deal now, but it's not growing fast enough. And another thing is the technology, we've, we've, we've made strides, but the technology is still clunky. And it is. It takes hours if you're really intensely interested in fully looking at a web page. Well, it does with the Prodigy. Maybe your br different browsers speed it up. Certainly your modem speed could help. But what I found talking to people that are really no computers is you're, you're, you could have a 28.8 BKP modem, but if Prodigy only runs at 12 BKP, it doesn't matter. You've wasted money on a much accelerated piece of technology, and you're stuck with the speed at which the web page you're in or the browser goes. So that's a very important, don't run out and buy a new, uh, a new you know, accelerated modem speed because you're, if you're using an intermediary for your uh, browser because you're going to be stuck. So it's slow. It takes incredible, and that's what they say in the, this article. They say we are incredibly insensitive to people's time, and that we've simply got to speed it up because uh, even for school kids, imagine assigning a task in class, and they're all trying to use their web browser even to get into one website. It takes forever. If you have time, it's great. You got to make time to use the internet, and you know, hear people who literally get sucked into it. Yeah, part of it isn't just it's fascinating and exciting, but it's time-consuming because it's slow. The second concern I have is the the um, uh, veracity of the material that's on there. If you use some of these Usenet and chat groups, if you're very careful citing stuff from those, because sometimes people just pull things out of thin air and claim it's true. Uh, there's some belief that this this rumor we always joke about, Jim and I do, being from Arkansas, as Jim is, about Vince Foster being murdered, started on the internet. Somebody just pulled it out of left air and then started creating the facts to go around this myth. Now, you know, it may be true, but the bottom line is it started out on the internet in a chat group and it grew from there. So uh, that, you have to be real concerned. That's pretty much why I focused on official uh, sources of information like websites, but certainly the other groups go for and all that. You can get a lot of good information there. My third concern is that we have to look at uh, how do we cite these items. Now the fourth edition of APA has begun to address that, but for your undergraduate students you need to be aware that they're now uh, APA and MLA are beginning to address that issue. And that I, I really do think, I know, I, I mean the first like five years ago, if somebody came to me and said, could I cite something on the internet, I would have laughed at them, you know, because my vision was he and another guy were talking on email or in a chat room. But now, since there are so many organizations and groups have official web pages, I think that it is certainly time to allow your students, and, and nay, not allow, just to begin to encourage them and say, please feel free to cite sources on the internet and then go to your APA and MLA guides if you're having them turn in a bibliography of any sort. Um, final thing is, that all things are not created equal. We are in the state of Kentucky. I am working in Mississippi. And I can tell you the state of, of integrating internet technology is slow at best, particularly for our educational institutions. It's expensive. Uh, it seems to disappear immediately. I, was, I, I saw Netscape on our brand new Apple computers in a lab at USM. I went, oh, this is so neat. And a colleague said, oh, that's the old Netscape. And I mean, that tells you right there. They're constantly upgrading the technology. What you think is new today will be quickly outdated tomorrow, and that's a decision you have to make. I would strongly encourage you, particularly if you're using your own money and time and resources to upgrade, be very careful about jumping out and buying Windows 95 or buying that new modem because it quickly will become 
First of all, it may be a guinea pig technology. We know about all the problems with Windows 95. And second, there may be better technology on the horizon. You'd be better off keeping that money in your purse or your wallet until better technology comes along. But, but, but be a very shrewd consumer. And wherever you can use your institution's resources, do so. Uh, I can't use USM's. A computer from home because it is overused, it is oversaturated, our ocean system, you cannot get on it. Three in the morning on a Sunday, I can't access the internet. That's why I went through Prodigy, because it just got ridiculous. And certainly there are cheaper, most areas, as you know, have local services that will get you much cheaper access, and I'll probably eventually go to that, but I just wanted to get on, and Prodigy was my, my easy, uh, uh, fail-safe option to do that. I'm thrilled. I think the internet is wonderful. I think we have to be concerned, though, that we don't, you know, uh, uh, treat it as a complete panacea for everything, because there are inaccuracies in the internet. There are inaccurate reports in the internet, inaccurate claims made, just as there are newspapers and other publications. And finally, I would say it's definitely a good place to start your research. I would not completely go away from CD-ROM and hard copy research just because of that. And certainly for, for corroboration, I would probably go beyond the Internet to double check the sources that are on there because uh, they're constantly updating them and sometimes they run on deadlines that, that create problems with the veracity of the information that's presented. And that's it. I'd like to mention a couple of things before I get into my presentation on media punditry. Bob was talking about websites, and I don't know if it's listed in the context of his paper, but I know there are a couple that you can also access. One is called All Politics, and the other one is called Vote Smart. Also, he was mentioning about the MLA style book. I know this because in my introduction to mass communication class, my students received subscriptions to Time Magazine. And then I believe it was last week's edition of Time Magazine, they mentioned about the MLA style book and how to cite sources from cyberspace. The new MLA style book is due to be published in late 1997. But my, my understanding is that MLA does have a website. So if you need to cite anything or have your students cite anything from cyberspace, that's one way to do it. Let me get into media punditry because I am a political junkie, I am a news junkie, and I am a sports junkie, and I'm always fascinated by the self-righteous, smug, self-serving comments of our good friends who are journalists and pseudo-pundits. Whenever I watch these programs, and I jotted down some ideas here as Bob was wrapping this up, I wrote down three topics. First of all, I think you have to judge many of these programs as entertainment. But I wrote down three topics, and the first one was TV weathermen before meteorology. They were often wrong, and they made no apologies for being wrong, and never said they were wrong after the fact. Next, I think of the Psychic Friends Network. <laughs> Whenever you watch the Psychic Friends Network, their rate of credibility is probably as high as what we see with some of our good friends on both the legitimate and some of the other talk shows that we see. Finally, I think of professional wrestling, and I think that's my favorite because people gesturing and posturing, and also some of the dysfunctional talk shows that we occasionally see where people are pointing fingers at each other and going nuts. Eric Alterman, a few years ago, wrote a book on media punditry, and I think his book probably overstated the importance of pundits. I think we all usually judge them with a jaded eye, and what I usually do in these types of programs and the first time I ever really talked about it in depth was at the 1993 CACA program, and I think the title of it was, I know it's hard to say CACA with a straight face, but it was redefining, something along the lines of redefining scholarly research. And what I do for many of my programs is to put together many documentaries. My emphasis of interest is broadcast journalism, and I like to put together a lot of different clips, and that's what I've done today. What you're going to see are my voiceovers along with edited materials from pundits in three separate areas. First of all, short clips from the 1992 presidential debates, short clips from the 1994 midterm elections, the Republican tsunami, and finally 1996 presidential debate speculation. And after we come back, I want to talk about some of the local programs, for instance, Arkansas Week in Review very briefly, because they're starting to get into that same realm. Washington Week in Review, Washington Journal on C-SPAN, they're very sedate, they encourage caller 
questions and faxes and email. But I think they're starting to, at least the local PBS programs are falling into this argumentation example. And I also have a quote at the end from Phil Jackson, who is the head coach of the Chicago Bulls, about what he thinks about this. Because sports talk radio often is not that much dissimilar from the political programs that we watch. Now, this is a 19-minute video. It's a little bit longer because the fact that Butch is not here. I'll show it in its entirety and make a couple of comments. But if you'd go ahead and hit play on there, Bob, it's queued up and ready to go. The TV's ready. The volume's ready. All you have to do is hit play. And like I said, this is self-encompassing. It's like a mini documentary, and it speaks for itself. And I want you to really pay attention to aspects concerning the horse race mentality, especially when we're talking about talking about the 1996 presidential election. Is this over? Since their inception on television in the late 1940s, political talk shows have taken on increased importance to news reporters and newsmakers. Issues or personalities of the day can often be amplified, as weekends, when these programs are shown, are typically lacking in news content. But are important events being sidetracked as more programs with opinionated columnists become prominent? As a result, will their analysis of issues be fair or instead be seen through ideological lenses? Are questions focusing more on the horse race than on policy? Could this constant fascination of who is up and down be contributing to a backlash of journalistic credibility by the American public? The video which accompanies this essay examines ideological punditry from various political events and talk shows representing network, cable, and public television. Specifically, video <laughs> clips are shown discussing the 1992 presidential debates, 1994 midterm election results, and 1996 presidential election speculation. This program shall examine just some of the programs on which pundits use their crystal balls. I'm the only person here who's ever balanced the government budget, and I've presented 12 of them and cut spending repeatedly. But you cannot just get there by balancing the budget. We've got to grow the economy by putting people first, real people like you. I got into this race because I did not want my child to grow up to be part of the first generation of Americans to do worse than our parents. We're better than that. We can do better than that. I want to make America as great as it can be, and I ask for your help in doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Clinton. You know, we see why Bill Clinton uh, suggested this format. It was obviously user-friendly for Clinton. I thought um, the audience's questions, I noticed that there was not one question relative to Vietnam or draft dodging or any of that sort of stuff that I think the president wanted to talk about. And uh, this was really uh, the Bill Clinton show. Bill Schneider. Well, I think we know exactly what each candidate will answer to any question. Uh, George Bush will say, I'm already doing it. We have a program in place. I don't think many people believe that. Ross Perot says, I can fix it somehow by a mysterious process of building a consensus. Bill Clinton says, I have a plan. And by God, he's going to give you three and four and five points of plans and programs and schemes and proposals. I don't think any of them had much new to say, but that means that nothing here changed the dynamics of this campaign. And that hurt President Bush because he had to change the dynamics of the campaign. I don't think it happened. I'm not sure how, how, the, how the audience sitting at home will judge it. It seemed to me that uh, Mr. Clinton was infinitely more comfortable in this format than the president. Good for let's talk about that. Uh, president Bush got high marks in the first joint appearance, or at least in the beginning, at least in the beginning. A looking and sounding presidential, and certainly there'll be those who said he did so in this format. On the other hand, Governor Clinton said that this format was his idea. Uh, from what you saw and heard, did he accomplish one of his goals of looking and sounding presidential in what he considers to be a very comfortable format? Yeah, I think so. And it's, it's what Susan was saying, you know, no knockdown stand, but they were playing by Marcos of Queensbury rules. Boy, were, were they polite. And, and what the problems were for Mr. Bush uh, were advantages for Clinton. He took a pass, essentially, very little talk about character, uh, a lot of talk about the economy, which is Clinton's strength. This was his format, as you say. This is what he has been practicing since the New Hampshire primary interactive talking with voters. This was Bill Clinton being his most presidential. He passed up a chance to attack the president on Iraq gate. The worst thing he said was a reference to read my lips. Uh, he got his uh, economic proposals across. He's playing to tie. He's ahead in the polls. And if there's one downside, it's when Bill Clinton thinks he's being presidential, he can get awfully passive. And there were a couple of moments I thought he was going to fade into the woodwork. 
They had a very different mission tonight from the first debate. In the first debate, they wanted Bill Clinton to look presidential. Tonight, they wanted voters to feel comfortable with him. That's why you saw Bill Clinton loosen up. He smiled a lot. He walked uh, down to the audience. He looked uh, at, at the, uh, the audience members. He looked at the cameras. Uh, the Clinton campaign made a conscious decision to try to get him to be more himself, so he wouldn't be so wouldn't, wouldn't be so programmed. They want people to be comfortable with him, and, and to a certain extent, I think they accomplished that tonight. Well, now you have been with Clinton since the early days in New Hampshire. I mentioned earlier he loves to be with the crowd. Do you recognize the Clinton we saw tonight as the most natural Clinton? I think this is the Clinton we see in this format. Uh, this is about the 13th town meeting format that he's done since New Hampshire. He's very comfortable in it. He likes it. It's probably where he does his best. Okay, Chris Fury. In addition to the political pundits, we have campaign spin doctors who try to get out positive debate messages, no matter how their candidates performed. Here are a few examples following the Richmond debate. Tori, were you happy with this format for your candidate? Oh, absolutely. The president has been doing what we call Ask George Bushes for years. He loves answering real questions from real people, and this evening has showed how good it works. He very aggressively, very forcefully laid out the case. He's the only candidate who has the record, the qualifications, and the agenda to be president. It was a terrific night for us. It was a terrific night for Bill Clinton, and we couldn't be happier. Um, I, I think no one's done more events like this than Bill Clinton has. He started back in New Hampshire, answering questions from real people, listening to them addressing their concerns head on, and I think he did that. I think George Bush shows tonight beyond a shadow of a doubt that he just doesn't get it. Now, shockingly, Sharon, I must tell you, the Tory thinks that George Bush won, and Dee Dee is convinced <laughs> that Clinton won. My hunch is you're going to lean toward Perot. Larry, that's why you are where you are. Absolutely, this was not medium. Uh, the um, uh, campaign came from the grassroots. It was the People's Forum tonight, and Ross Perot was there talking to the American people. He clearly, I thought, dominated the stage and the discussion tonight, and I was very, very pleased with the way it came out. Well, I think the president has to show that he's got a dynamic agenda for the future, and the difficulty is that the last three and a half years get in the way of that. There really aren't all that many precedents that, that suggest that a president in his circumstances now, as far behind in the polls as he is, really has any clear way to get out of this pickle. In fact, there's a, a horrible set of precedents if you look at the previous incumbent presidents who've been in some trouble in late October, and you don't see anybody who's been in as much trouble as he's in now, as far behind in the polls. And I think one of the strains on George Bush is going to be keeping his chin up in the next two, two and a half weeks. The 1994 midterm election stunned both the nation and the news media. Negative feelings about President Clinton in particular led to Republican majorities in the House and Senate. Surprising results also occurred in state gubernatorial races. How are these events covered by mainstream and alternative media? If this election forces him to do what, in, in my view, his instincts were in the first place, and the congressional leadership forbade him from doing for two years, it might be an interesting two years. Okay. I think it's been very key, too, that the liberal base did not do him any good in this election. You look at Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, New York, the liberals that he went to to try to get out that base at the last bit didn't come. Those seats were lost. Only in Virginia did you see it. And Virginia was so accurate because of Oliver North's situation. So I think that he has a real opportunity here to be the kind of Democrat he ran as, which is a new centrist Democrat, instead of having to play to that liberal base. They so failed him today. Over on my left, I hear all is not lost over my right. What, what contributed most, do you think, to the loss here? Oh, I think it was anti-Democrat and anti-Clinton that they simply perceived that the Clinton administration and the Democrats in Congress couldn't do the job. Now, you're going to hear a lot of talk in the next uh, few days, few weeks, about cooperation between the Democratic president and the Republican Congress. Well, you can hear Phil Graham there tonight say the onus is on us yeah. to lead. Yeah, don't or... believe it. It won't <laughs> last very long. Uh, 1996 is a presidential election. The 1996 presidential campaign starts tomorrow morning. And the Republicans in Congress, they can smell the chance to bring Clinton down in 96. They're not going to give him an inch. 
And he's going to be on the defensive. He's not going to give them an inch. It's going to be critical. You already feel, David, the Senate, the presidential restarting in the Senate. Yeah, it's tonight. Yeah. It's already started. We're still watching some of the results coming in and keeping our fingers crossed for people like Senator Dianne Feinstein and Ann Winnie who's running up in Minnesota. Uh, and we'll just have to wait and see what the final results are. But we would have liked to have won more races tonight. And clearly the American people are uh, disappointed in the state of government generally. This is a, a referendum on Washington and Congress and government generally. I think the president clearly now will reach out to the Republicans, to the new Republican leader, should that be the case, tomorrow morning, and look towards working together to start rebuilding this country, uh, to reform government, and to get moving forward. It's not about moving right or left, it's about moving forward. That's the president's commitment. I think that's where he'll want to go tomorrow. The president campaigned very hard for Mario Cuomo in New York State. Looks like George Pataki has now won. This must be a major source of disappointment in New York State. Well, absolutely. I mean, Governor Cuomo did a wonderful job for 12 years. Uh, he was one of the most articulate and impassioned Democrats in the country. Uh, his leadership will be missed. I'm sure he won't retreat from public life, however. Uh, uh, President Clinton did campaign for him. I think it helped. It was a close race. Uh, the governor came from uh, a ways back and almost got over the top. So uh, we were grateful for that, but disappointed in the outcome. Okay, Dee Dee Myers, thank you very much for spending some time with us. Now back to the national list. Let's let their, the message of freedom go forth. We will not allow little children their rights to be trampled on in the public schools anymore. It's not going to happen. That was one of the reasons there was such an overwhelming electoral shift in November. One of the uh, uh, network announcers, the, the anchor on ABC, uh, who will remain nameless, uh, said American voters were having a temper tantrum, like two-year-old children. There was no temper tantrum. The American voters were very cool and calm to say, we don't like the liberal media, we don't like the ACLU and people from the American way and the Gay Rights Caucus and these others taking away our freedom. We don't like the elimination of our moral values from the public square. We don't like it. And we're going to put people in office who will change the laws to get them back the way they used to be. And you hear the chorus of screams now, oh, you might bring back prayer to the school. Well, isn't that terrible? We have drugs in the school. We have teenage pregnancies. We're giving out condoms to little children against their parents' will in junior high school. And yet there's this hue and cry that somehow saying a prayer to God is going to affect their children. That is nonsense. special message for those, and I know you liberals are tuning in, you got the lights out, you're cowered in the corner, <laughs> and you don't want to admit to anybody that you're watching this, we know you're there, <laughs> and if you were scared, but don't worry, those jet planes, they're still yours, in fact, there may be even more now, <laughs> I just want to leave you with this. We feel your pain. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> Is it appropriate that Dick Morris be getting 
two million dollar book deals and being covered and treated the way he is? Well, I think it's amazing that reading some of these accounts, we have not had a Clinton administration since 1994. We've had a Dick Morris administration that almost everything he said, he says, you know, I dictated the speech. Uh, this strategy was mine, that strategy. Even some of his own allies have started to complain uh, that it wasn't, you know, hey, wait a minute, that was my idea, not Dick Morris's. I think it's just unseemly. It, it just seems wrong. But anybody right, who has written a book and complains about somebody else's advance is automatically suspect. Well, well, something about. that EJ doesn't ever talk about is the market, Judge Hill. Mm -hmm. The market pays him the money. Good for Dick Morris. Can Bob Dole win this election, George? It will take what the economists call exogenous forces. They mean earth right like or something. Like that. Don't go <laughs> <talk> dirty here. <laughs> it would take uh, felony indictments of senior people in the White House. It would take uh, maybe the critical mass of public disgust of some of the squalor accumulating around this White House, something like that. But right now the country is happy. The uh, unemployment rate is 5.1%. Lowest uh, in seven years. It hasn't been that steadily since 1970, I believe it is. The economy's humming and people are content. I sort of agree. If things go along just as they are going along, it can't be slow and steady wins the race for Bob Dole. Some combination of events have to occur. The good news, I suppose, for uh, Senator Dole is that they almost always do. Look at what's happening in Iraq. Now, I don't want to make political capital over that, but this thing could play out in a way that would be very injurious to the president. Uh, that would give him an opening. The bond market has gone nuts. They don't like good news, George. The bond traders say that's all going to raise interest rates. And if uh, the Fed decides to go along and raise interest rates to try to keep inflation down, but short of those kinds of things, I think the jig is up. Does that mean, Bill, that Republicans are panicking? I think they're a few days away from it. They may pretty soon. I mean, when you look at the economy, it's hard to see how Clinton loses. And when you look at the Dole campaign, it's hard to see how Clinton loses. But when you look at Clinton, you, you think, well, gee, maybe he could lose. And one last thing, Brian, I am convinced he should still announce he's going to run for one term. Ah, that he's 73 years old. He'll never do it. Give me one shot without any hopes of being reelected. Because Bill Clinton, you know what he's going to do if he's reelected? I'm on my final mission. You don't have to worry about me. I will do the right thing, not the political side. Sounds good. Gwen, what, if I put you in charge, what do you do? Well, I kind of agree with him a little bit about the about making the case about the next four years. I don't know if I disagree about I agree about saying this is my this is it for me because people go yes it is and it makes us all kind of. <laughs> <laughs> that he has to make the case about what is wrong with Bill Clinton, what the risk is for the next four years. Right now, people don't think that there's any risk. They kind of like the status quo, and he has never consistently, I'm surprised, made that case. Brian, well, I want to make the case. The age issue is killing Dole, and it's not a matter of that they think that he is not physically or mentally up to the challenge. They think he's old and out of it. He has got to persuade people that he has solutions that can help their lives and that he gets it, that he understands what America is about today. Ross Perot will be in at least one of the presidential committees. Uh, John, uh, Jack Kemp's endorsement of Louis Farrakhan's self-help uh, this past week is going to backfire on him, the Jewish voters. It already has. And well, it's going to happen again. May home backfire. Well, that's, that's, that's not my home. Okay, okay. incremental backfire. Thank, thanks for the time. Quickly. Uh, if Bob Dole should win one state in the union, it's Texas, but Bill Clinton is going to go in and challenge him and try to help elect Democratic uh, congressional candidates there. Uh, contrary to Eleanor, I predict that the debate commission will exclude uh, Ross Perot and Pat Shook from the debates next week. Bill Clinton looks strong to win back the White House soon. But can he help his fellow Democrats recapture the Congress? And a better question, does he really want to help them do that? Bye-bye. After the shouting has died down, and after opinions have given way to substantive impartial issue analysis, is anything of value learned from political pundits? Can we stand their brand of self-righteous, all-knowing, smug remarks? Of course, any savvy viewer can separate posturing, myopic blather from substantive political analyses. Problems can potentially arise if political partisans see ideas or personalities they do not agree with on these programs. However, there must always be a sense of perspective when critically evaluating these examples. Those shrill exchanges can often make political talk show participants sound more like professional wrestlers. Solid information can still be obtained. 
For those viewers who intensely dislike the genre, low-key programs like Washington Week in Review on PBS or Washington Journal on C-SPAN, the latter featuring viewer questions, faxes, and email, may prove to be preferable fare. For the rest, it is a matter of not taking issues personally with reporters or columnists and turning the television volume down a bit when they air. Yeah, you can go ahead. You can go ahead and stop it. Just turn the TV off, Bob. That's good well. enough. Let me mention a couple of things, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Bob because he wants to talk about Dick Morris for just a moment. <coughs> As far as the local programs are concerned, the one that I've become really interested in locally is Arkansas Week in Review. And they're starting, as I mentioned before the video start, before the video began, to get into the posturing and gesturing habit, even though not to the degree of the granddaddy of all of these programs, the McLaughlin Group. And when I watch McLaughlin, it reminds me very much of a program which was more liberal in tone, which aired in the late 1970s and early 80s, Agronsky and Company, which featured Carl Rowan, Elizabeth Drew, and other journalists. I want to wrap this up today with two things. First of all, I don't think we should take the journalists and pundits as seriously as they do. The, the video, and one is I met Dick Morris at SSCA in Memphis last year, and uh, he did a presentation there for which uh, uh, a check may have appeared in the, uh, uh, the uh, publication that aired the story about his dalliances. But what was interesting about his, his uh, presentation there uh, was that he talked about, uh, he acted as a political pundit. A lot of his presentation was predictions about that. One was Hillary would have a big role. Well, except for the convention, she hasn't done much but crawl back in her shell. And the other uh, element is that, that he was getting a lot of credit for things that Clinton had done. But uh, uh, as several people have pointed out, Morris would come up with really wild ideas in staff meetings, like uh, the issue we need to pump up is that uh, voters, uh, you know, need to, uh, uh, you know, they need to be able to get more credits for their houses or something. He'd come up with some bizarre idea and Clinton would have to veto it. So a lot of the decision making wasn't just Morris that's catapulted him into the current electoral standing that he has. It's taking the good ideas from about 20 or 30, because Dick Morris is one of these idea guys, and coming up with it. Um, I do think it's obviously for the Democrats unfortunate that, he, that this happened. But that's the cyclical nature of Bill Clinton's governance, even when he was governor of Arkansas. Bill Clinton can't stand prosperity. And like the pundits are saying, I think they're right. There'll be another screw-up. Iraq could be it. It could be something else. He can't stand prosperity. Every time he reaches the heights and looks invincible, a disaster befalls him. And Remember there'll probably the, be at least one more before the, the election. The David Marinus book describes that. Just can't stand prominence. I don't know what happens. Uh, the other thing I was going to say real quick about Bob Dole and age, uh, the web page site I, I alluded to earlier is so hip. It's not like Bob Dole. Maybe that's why I liked it. And maybe you'll like it too if you, if you access it. It's very hip. And it doesn't seem, if you didn't know Bob Dole, and there are no, there, there's pictures of Bob Dole, obviously, uh, uh, you, if you didn't know his age and had no picture of him, you would picture him kind of like reading a novel as a young dynamic person based on a lot of the stuff in the web page and obviously that isn't the case. The last thing I was going to mention is uh, they talk about good programming, Washington Week in Review, that kind of thing, C-SPAN programming. Uh, one of the little uh, copied features of C-SPAN that's also mentioned in their web page is the use of the daily newspaper. Maybe some of you have seen it. C-SPAN started it and that was the early morning call-in program. I mean early morning, like 6 a.m. Uh, a moderator and a guest are sitting in a studio with the Capitol backlit in the background and they're going through, they have callers calling in and they say, well, who are you from? Akron, Ohio. Tell us what's on your front page today. Well now MSNBC does that. Uh, the Today Show does it. Uh, and it's copied directly from C-SPAN. It's a cute little touch. It, it connects uh, uh, viewers and listeners with uh, what's going on in there. It makes them feel that what's happening locally is important nationally. Uh, but, but a lot of this, uh, you know, final comment I'd make is a lot of them, obviously what, what's happening in the national media conglomerates, where they're trying to synergize all the media because eventually TV will be computers, newspaper will be computers, the, the, the cyber center will be the focus of all media. 
And so uh, separating them, MSNBC is the first shot in this direction, makes no sense. And they're aware of that. Tie the computer to the TV. Tie the newspaper to the TV. And uh, that's where we're going. And it's an exciting but but uh, uh, shocking time because the changes will happen so rapidly. And CNN, of course, ties in inside politics with CNN Interactive, and they talk about vote smart and pol all politics. I think there may be another one called politics now. I'm not sure. But Bob talked about MSNBC and how closely they work with the new cable network, MSNBC, which, which used to be America's Talking. And I am not happy at all with the quality of MSNBC. It no. takes forever, especially the first couple of days that it was online, it took forever to download anything. And in terms of just getting access to information, CNN Interactive is great. Not really happy with MSNBC. They don't update their material as often, and there really isn't as much available. But if any of you have any questions or comments, feel free to fire away. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed both presentations. Bob, there's one thing, though, that you did talk about, Smith. From the Dole Center, you can download a screensaver. Oh, okay. Did you see that? I, I must have missed it. Yeah. You so you can have Bob Dole covering your screen in those off right. moments. Yeah. <laughs> or, or your Macintosh or your, uh, you know, IBM before. I'll have to go back and check that. I have a question. Bob Dole ever been on uh, you know that that is a real good point. Yes, the uh, the articles I accessed concerning the convention, they had a lot of major Republican Party officials in San Diego uh, do chat lines. They put them in front of a computer, and some of them couldn't type. The Lieutenant Governor of Idaho was one of them, a woman. Uh, they brought her up, and she literally almost blew the screen out. She hit the wrong key, and thousands of people that were asking her questions were suddenly cut off. They moved her to another computer. Uh, there's a real concern uh, in, in amongst even Republican and Democratic Party operatives that the technology they try to integrate in San Diego and in Chicago is nice. It's wonderful. And the Columbia Journalism Review article is this. This is really nice technology. What's the point if only, even if thousands access it? That's not enough, folks. These systems cost millions of dollars. If only 10,000 people access your website, you're failing in terms of whatever you're trying to achieve. Communicate your message, uh, get people to donate money, whatever. It's not paying for itself. And I'm sorry, politics is a business. And particularly with the political web pages, if it's not paying for itself, they're, they're going to have to make changes. Uh, and, and it's not paying for itself. It's a nice technology. It's hip. It's now. It's happening. But is it really a big impact thing? And the answer is probably not for will, most voters. Will we be an information rich versus an information poor society? And one thing that Bob talked about in terms of downloading stuff taking forever. Stuff through the phone line often takes a long time, and sometimes material has to come through in all print because it takes a long time to download the graphics. But I know that many, many cable systems are trying to get into the computer business because it's so much quicker with a cable connection into the back of your computer. Oh, time will only tell how fast all of that is going to is going to change. And one other thing, Bob was talking about the Lieutenant Governor of Idaho being uh, being somewhat challenged in terms of her abilities to use computers. The first time I ever saw it, well, I think was back in 94, when Al Gore was going, I believe he was on a chat line answering questions and they ran it live on C-SPAN. And he really has been at the front of this information technology infrastructure. And he was an impetus for the White House webpage. Absolutely. That was his thing. And he's right about the, the Republican websites. The Republicans always seem to be about one, one or two steps ahead of the Democrats in terms of not only technology, but also campaign television commercials. They used to, they would in 1994 use the morphing technique and morph the congressperson or the candidate for office, morph that person into Bill Clinton. And of course, now we're seeing it in reverse with it being done to Newt Gingrich. Any other questions? Just a comment. I'll sure. remember. I, I think one of the biggest problems with us analyzing all these political talk shows and, and commercials and all that stuff is that it has always been a horse race. It has never been anything about it. And the interesting thing is, it's it, you're right. It's always going to be that. It's always going to be that way. For instance, when we see seminars on C-SPAN after the presidential election, remember you were talking about 1991 yesterday. Whenever we see these seminars, they'll always say. We really think this is going to change in 2000. Yes, it will change for the worse. It will get worse each time. 
unless there's some cataclysmic event of which we're not aware. But yeah, we're always dealing with the horse race. You go back to the 1988 race. After the 1988 election, Ted Koppel held one of his viewpoint programs. It was either 90 minutes or two hours. And he had a very large round table of people talking about media coverage of the 1988 election. And you see Jim Lake was one of the advisors media-wise to George Bush talking about the fact that the horse race is something that we always deal with. In fact, they showed a clip from ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings talking about the electoral college lock that George Bush had against Michael Dukakis. And the Dukakis campaign felt like, that's the end, we have no chance. But the reason they had no chance was because their campaign management was so inept more than anything else. The, the one thing, uh, uh, just a quick comment, I watched a very extensive presentation after the, the day after the Chicago Convention ended with the official pollster, I think his name's Stanley Greenberg of the Democratic Party, and he said, folks, we're all rejoicing because we have, according to that time, 23-point lead. He said, it ain't going to last. And he said, it's okay it doesn't last. We don't need a 23-point victory to win House seats and Senate seats and gubernatorial, you know, governor's mansions. 5%, if we, can, if we can just 5% or higher, we will blow out the Republicans. And he said, you need to be aware of that. There's a natural tightening process that always happens the last two weeks of the election. Expect it. Don't be freaked out by it. But don't stop doing whatever volunteer work or whatever you're doing. Keep at it. Uh, he says, we're no way we are going to win you know, the presidency by 23%. If we win it by 7, that's a landslide. Johnson only had 8 when Johnson in 64 took almost every state, he only won by 8%. But that's a landslide because we have an electoral college system. And so he said, you need to be aware that there's no way, no one has ever won the presidency in modern times in double digits. And if we do, we'll be making history. I mean, we, we will dominate uh, uh, House and, and Senate races because it which ought to have a spillover effect. But I thought that was an interesting comment because you do have people who, oh my gosh, the race is tightening, the horse race mentality. Well, it's going to tighten. It's going to tighten because most people don't really make up their minds. The middle ground people who don't have strong party affiliation don't make up their minds for the last five days anyway, or in the voting booth in some cases. I do need to, I do need to make a slight correction. I, in the 1964 election, I believe President Johnson won with 61% of the vote, Goldwater carried 39. If you go to the 84 election, I believe Reagan beat Mondale 59 to 41. The last time we had a, a real landslide probably would be the 84 the 84 election. You're, you're right about popular vote, but the, 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 this is the median margin across states was okay. 8%. So the popular vote, yeah, he won some states by huge, larger margins, but the median was 8%. And, that's and right now, about. since we're talking about the horse race, in 92, Clinton received 370 electoral votes, 100 more than he needed. And right now, if we go into the, if, if we go into the academic slash pundit mode, if things, if things stand in November the way they do now, they'll probably wind up with more than that. So, but you're right. The, the horse race is something that's always going to be. And it here. doesn't matter what we think about the issues. It's the, the public down there. But the interesting, you know, you know, the interesting thing to me, and I'm. Uh, the ones I'm, that are going to be on the I'm glad we are watch these shows are the ones. I'm glad, glad we have some time to talk about this because, and I mentioned this at the end of my paper, we have some lesser lights in journalism, and my favorite is Mona Charon, who was on the Capitol Gang Sunday, and she is not one of my favorites, and it has nothing to do with ideology, but. Whenever, whenever I look at her credits as far as punditry is concerned, she was a speech writer for Nancy Reagan. And I've read some of her writings, and they're interesting, but does that give you immediate access to be a, to be a pundit? How do you get on Crossfire? Bill Press, who, who you know? equal, equal time, Bill Press. He was a Democrat operative in California, and that gave him access to be a host on Crossfire. Of course, Crossfire is different because it's manufactured argument. You go this way, I go this way, never the twain shall meet. It doesn't really matter. It's manufactured controversy. Well, thank you all for coming. And, yeah, uh, thank you. Why don't you get on to your other program? Have you guys given any thought to trying to figure out if the websites are preaching to the converted or trolls? Oh, I mean, yeah, that's, they got to be. It's, it's, like, like, only I mean, it's like Rush Limbaugh. It's like Rush Limbaugh. Yeah, Rush Limbaugh is preaching to the choir. When you look at that material, but more you people watch him because, he was, because he's entertaining. Yeah, he you know? And isn't it interesting how 
My, His uh, program now is all the I default hope I get this and right, he's looking for a new venue. Right I mean, how he rose and fell. Yeah. Two and years that, ago, he was sitting high, and yeah. now he's... Would you like he, the problem was he aligned himself too closely oh, yeah. with the Republicans. So now, yeah. so now, instead of being on the oh, outside, outside he's, 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 he's viewed as being... <laughs> yeah, well, so so part of the I was so kind of embarrassed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it took me so long to get on the web. we perceived that as being a problem after two years. You bet. Well, it only took two years to decide that uh, that wasn't what we should have done. Because I wonder about that. You know, I, I have access to Netscape. The students have been looking at some of these websites and the political communication class I'm teaching, and I and when they come in and say, I got this off of this page, I have to start saying to them, and I to think about who put this page on and why they put this page on. Exactly. What are their motivations? How pure is this page, you know? Absolutely. And it's like anything you see on TV. And it's like, well, it's been since the 90s. It's very important. Yeah. It's Eric, like I said, Eric Alderman well, takes the whole thing too seriously. But when I watch well, these, Gary's I always view them with a grain of salt. Yeah, I, I love them too. They're great entertainment, and I look at them as nothing. That's it. I remember you did a, you did a, a paper at SCA yeah, in Chicago several years ago about how many, what percentage of times they made predictions were they correct, and it was some incredible slow number, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very low. <laughs> and they are. Thanks, they're they're, 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 they're oh, yeah. They're whether they're going to work before meteorologists, before Dr. Ray, that's their political management. Exactly. 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 Ex